fourth grade scientist. This is Ms. Baldry. So our video this week is going to be all about adaptations. And I want you to be thinking, what is adaptation and what plants or animals do you know have adaptations? And we have been learning so far about our different ecosystems here in Utah. So we've been learning about the plants and animals that belong to the forest ecosystem, the wetland ecosystem, and desert ecosystems. And um, the organisms, organisms are just living things. They have adapted or changed um, to meet the needs of their environment to help them to survive. So you're going to be learning about specific animals in Utah's ecosystem and how they have adapted. So our video today may have some animals that are not found in Utah, but the point is for you to learn more about adaptations and how plants and animals adapt or change to survive in their environment. So I hope that you really enjoy your video today. An adaptation is a characteristic which helps an organism to survive in its environment. Plants and animals must adapt so that they can compete for resources and live successfully in their habitat. Some adaptations can help organisms to not get eaten, hide, control body temperature or prevent water loss. An adaptation gives an organism a better chance of surviving in its environment. A well adapted animal is the polar bear, who has many adaptations for survival in the Arctic. Their white appearance camouflages them against snow, making it very hard for prey to spot them. They have thick layers of fat and fur to insulate them from the cold. Their fur is greasy so it dries quickly after swimming. They have big feet to spread their weight on the ice and to increase grip. And they also have a small surface area to volume ratio to minimise heat loss. Another interesting example of an adaptation is the fur of the snowshoe hare, whose fur changes colour. It is white in the winter to hide in snow and brown in the summer to camouflage in grass. So, all you have to remember when thinking of how organisms adapt is what the organism is competing for and what would help them to survive in their environment. Where do you live? On a country farm? In a big city? Up in the mountains? Or right by the ocean? The place where you live is your habitat, made up of the environment and other organisms or living things that surround you. No matter whether you live in the desert or at the top of a high-rise building in a big city, you interact with other organisms all the time. You have to, to survive. You breathe oxygen that's been released into the air by photosynthesizing plants. You eat animals, plants, and even fungi as nourishment for your body. And once that food is in your body, bacteria and suck break it down so your body can use it. In this chapter, we're going to learn all about how organisms live in their habitats, how they interact with other organisms around them, and how they adapt to survive in the environment surrounding them. We humans have adapted clever brains, nimble hands, and the use of tools, which have allowed us to survive and flourish in different environments across the earth by changing and constructing our own habitats to suit our needs. But in addition to changing the environment, organisms themselves change over time to fit into their habitats, and they develop unique adaptations to survive there. Some organisms work together to survive, like the bacteria in our gut that breaks down our food in return for us providing them with a nice place to live. Other organisms are in constant conflict and struggle against each other to survive. Get ready to learn some amazing stories of how different organisms live in some of the craziest places and how they interact with each other in ways that you never imagined. Plants have many adaptations to help them survive in their environment, where they may be competing for light, water, space or nutrients from the soil. The cactus is well adapted to surviving in very dry environments. Cacti minimise their surface area by replacing leaves with spines. This is so that they don't lose too much water through transpiration. 
The less surface area they have exposed to the outside air, the less water can escape out. The spines are also an adaptation to protect cacti from the animals that might eat them. Thick stems for storing water and also a waxy coating to stop water from escaping. And also, they have extensive root systems to collect water from a large area. Alright boys and girls, so we have learned about what an adaptation is. An adapt means to change, um, so an adaptation is, is the same thing. It's a change that an organism or a living thing has made to meet the needs of their environment to help them to survive. So. The last little video clip um, showed a cactus and um, we learned that a cactus doesn't have leaves that fall down like a deciduous plant. It has got needles, it's got the spines and um, the spines help collect water. We also learned that the cactus also has a really thick waxy skin and that traps in water. That's another adaptation because it lives in the desert where there's not much water and there's a long root system. And we've also learned about how plants and animals, and um, including humans, how they interact or how they work together. And so um, plants and animals and humans, we all interact in our different environment. So we're going to be watching about a three minute video clip on how desert plants adapt or how they have adaptations. Annual rainfall is usually less than 8 inches and temperatures can exceed 115 degrees in the summer. Humans and other animals can modify their behavior to survive life in the desert. Snowbirds return to their homes in the north. Locals head indoors to their air conditioning. Deer head to higher elevation. Plants don't have the luxury of migrating to cooler climes in the summer. They literally are rooted in place. For the next few minutes, we'll explore adaptations of desert plants that allow them to survive the arid Sonoran Desert. When people are asked to name a desert plant, often cacti are the first mentioned. Cacti have a number of adaptations that make them perfectly adapted to desert life. Transpiration, water loss through stems and leaves, is minimized by the modification of leaves as spines. Photosynthesis is conducted in the stems instead. During the day, chlorophyll-rich stems capture light energy. At night, carbon dioxide is fixed into sugars and other carbohydrates. The spines also protect the cactus from predators and sunburn. Yes, even cacti can get a sunburn. Succulus is an adaptation seen in cacti and other desert plants, including agaves. Agaves store water in their fleshy leaves, allowing them to survive periods of drought. Non-succulent plants use other strategies for survival. Many woody desert plants reduce losses due to transpiration with small leaves. Others like ocotillos are drought deciduous, dropping leaves during dry time. The Palo Verde is a drought deciduous tree that has green photosynthetic stems. Even while leafless, the Palo Verde can perform photosynthesis. This hoboba has waxy leaves, oriented vertically, which minimizes exposure to the sun and water loss. Desert wildflowers are ephemeral or short lived. If there is ample rainfall, wildflower seeds germinate and quickly carpet the desert floor with color. Ephemerals go from seed to blooming to seed in a very short period of time. Eventually, temperatures will drop, the rains will come. We can all learn a lesson from these resilient desert plants. In some parts of the world, the beauty of winter masks the stress it poses for plants. During this season, sunlight is scarce, temperatures plunge, 
and soil often becomes hard with ice. Plants here get ready for these conditions in the fall when most begin to lose their green color. They stop making new chlorophyll, the chemical needed to produce food. As the old chlorophyll breaks down, the color of leaves begins to change. Deciduous trees shed their leaves each year and remain inactive until spring, kind of like bears in hibernation. But conifers are hardy adapters to all kinds of environments. Their flexible branches bend as snow accumulates, dropping loads of snow to the ground below. Most have small leathery leaves, shaped like scales or needles. A waxy coating keeps moisture in and guards against ice. The narrow shape of needles lets the wind and snow pass between them and prevents them from drying out. Since many conifers don't lose their leaves, they are ready to produce food as soon as spring arrives. Other plants have to grow new leaves all over again. In some of the hottest places on Earth, cactus plants withstand unforgiving conditions. The giant saguaro cactus lives in the Sonoran Desert in the southwest United States. Here, temperatures climb to more than 100 degrees and less than 4 inches of rain falls each year. With plenty of sun, they get the energy they need, but water is a much different story. To collect moisture, they rely on a network of wide-spreading roots that cover large areas of the desert ground. They grow a good distance apart from each other as a result. Their tough, rubbery outer layer helps them store any moisture for months at a time. For a short time during the spring, the saguaro produces white blossoms. These buds open at night, providing a feast for long-nosed bats. The bats feed on the flowers and pollinate the cacti at the same time. This allows energy-rich fruit to form. Its seeds will feed all kinds of desert animals. These cacti reach heights of up to 50 feet and can live for almost 300 years. Surprisingly, their biggest threat isn't the heat at all. It comes from cities that are expanding nearby. Hi scientists, so to end this video we're going to be looking at three different photographs of birds and um, you're trying to figure out what the adaptation is. So the first one is a snowy egret. Why does it look like it's dancing? Well, it's not really dancing. It's actually stirring its toes in the water to attract fish, and then it will get the fish, and that's how it gets food. The middle one is a white-tailed kite, and how is this like a toy? Well, the name gives you a clue, and it hovers like a kite floating in the air, and then its sharp eyes are looking down below to get something to eat, and then it pounces on it. The third one is a double-crested cormorant, and why is it standing out like that? No, it can do that for a really long time. Well, most birds have waterproof feathers, and this one doesn't. And its advantage or adaptation is so they can actually dive down and get fish. So, boys and girls, we've learned about adaptations today and how that helps animals survive. So, we'll see you in class.